Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. everybody, Noel here. Welcome to John Ocrifa, a branch of Masters of Carpentry exploring various spin-offs, tie-ins, and sequels to the films of John Carpenter, as well as a number of unproduced projects he was involved with. Such is the case with Prey. Some of our followers may have seen an earlier version of this article on our website, back when John Ocrifa was intended to be a text-only feature, but as our main show is a podcast, and many of our listeners are probably catching the show through feeds and may miss any such articles on the site itself, I've decided to take a bit of inspiration from Professor Allen and Emily, who craft wonderful audio essays for relativelygeekypodcast.blogspot.com. So here we are, for the first official audio installment of John Ocrifa. Going into the screenplay of Prey, I knew almost nothing about it. I didn't know the story, I didn't know the production history, I didn't even know when it was written. Some research reveals it was written for Warner Brothers in 1975. Carpenter's co-writer is James Nichols the assistant director and post-production supervisor of Assault on Precinct 13. Outside of that, I don't know anything else about the nature of their relationship as they never worked together again. The script was written for director Bob Clark, who was famous at the time for his proto-slasher classic Black Christmas. According to an interview with Clark shortly before his death, he and Carpenter batted around a number of ideas for a horror thriller, including some ideas Carpenter had for a Black Christmas sequel which would later evolve into Halloween. We get into those specifics in our episode covering Halloween, but this script itself also features a number of proto-Halloween elements, which I'll get into in a bit. The plot follows a trio of women in Tennessee who set out to climb Mount Tobias, a daunting peak with a jagged tear on one side, and a troubled history of past expeditions. Elaine is a flashy reporter hoping the climb will make for a big local story and boost her to a new time slot. Rose is a survivalist and sports equipment designer hoping the publicity will showcase her new line of tracksuits and equipment. Kathy is a mom and housewife whose only real escape is her morning run, who just wants to go out and do something exciting. Being women, their desire to prove themselves is seen as threatening by all the dudes they encounter, a rival reporter, a sporting goods store owner, a doubting husband, a sheriff, local yokels, all of whom have little to offer but glares and warnings. To be slightly fair, the mountain is a dangerous place some of the men have lost family to, and their concern is sincere, but the way it's expressed in streams of why would a gal want to do something crazy like that add fuel to the fire which drives the women to succeed. So yeah, it's a story of feminism written by a pair of guys in the 70s. There is good stuff in there, like the women all holding their own as action kicks into gear in the second half, and things like errors in mapping and sore feet being presented as what comes with the territory instead of something just afflicting their gender. These women are smart, capable people. The most driven, Elaine, is also the weakest, but that's because all she wants is a story. Rose is an avid, skilled camper and hunter, and Kathy doesn't just jog every morning. She's a trained sprinter who often outruns boys in her neighborhood. So this story gets a lot of points for painting strong, well-developed lead women. However, it then rips open two of their tops as they're exposed to the threat. I'll warn you, things are going to get a little weird here. At the close of the Civil War, a community of Confederates, and I can see a number of you already figuring out where this is going, yes, took to the hills and kept their ways and pure bloodlines alive until food started to become scarce and sickness swept through, so all that's left is one little family in a little shack on the mountainside, scavenging from and feeding off of any poor soul to cross her path. Swain and Grandma are the elderly heads of the house, with their two sons Otis, a massive slab of muscle with Down syndrome, and yes, I know that doesn't exactly work that way, and Luke, a feral young man locked in the attic who acts like a dog. Swain wants to keep the bloodline alive, and since neither Otis nor himself are capable of seeding fresh oats, the three women are plucked from their camp and led, one after another, into Luke's attic room. So yes, the feminist examination takes a 70s grindhouse turn as the ladies are captured by Confederate mountain men and used as breeding stock for Confederate mountain babies. You can probably see the problem here and know things don't entirely hold together. It must be said, there is no actual rape like I feared there would be. Rose, the muscle of the team, is the first led into the room, and she's killed by Luke after she puts up a strong fight and starts bashing his head in with a post. With their trained survivalist gone, Elaine and Kathy have to hold their own, 
So when Elaine goes up, she's gentle to Luke, who, like a dog, responds to this with kindness and curiosity, until she sticks a flare in his mouth and bursts his head into flames. With him dead and the house on fire, Kathy kills Grandma, and the two women rush into the mountain woods with Swain and Otis on their tail. The stretch in the shack is really, really weird, with the women roped up like cattle and force-fed porridge at a table with a thwack to their legs with a fire poker any time they stand up. What's most chilling about the Mountain family is that they aren't leering and prancing and going all crazy. No, they're quiet. They're tired. They know nothing about the outside, seeing it as filled with the monsters who won the war and crushed their people down. There's a sadness to the way they're making one last attempt to keep their way of life alive, anchored by the horror of how little they see the outsiders as actual people, treating the women as animals. So yes, it's an attempt at a feminist statement where the antagonists literally try to domesticate the ladies as beasts of burden. And no, this statement doesn't entirely work. It feels extremely uncomfortable and misguided and tonally way off, and I don't know that two dudes in the 70s were really the best people to be exploring this. However, I would be remiss if I didn't point people towards our episode on Someone's Watching Me, where Carpenter actually did successfully explore a lot of this stuff on his own, and made a fantastic film in the process. Prey is an interesting stepping stone to that, where he goes off a little too far, but by the time he actually made that statement himself, he reeled it back in and delivered it in a very smooth, concise, and thoughtful way. Now back to Prey, thankfully things pick up in the last quarter of the script. Elaine is hobbled by an injured foot, so she waits at the peak of the mountain for a helicopter which is supposed to come and pick them up, while having to dodge the tracking skills of old Swain. Kathy, meanwhile, full tilt sprints her way down the mountain, covering in a couple of hours or so the entire distance they took a couple of days to climb, with Otis bulldozing through the woods on her tail. This is the most exciting portion of the script, with the quiet tension of Elaine's evasion intercut with the pounding action of Kathy ripping downhill, around trees and rocks, narrowly avoiding spills and cliffs. Elaine, sadly, doesn't make it. Kathy does. Kathy reaches the bottom where the sheriff and the yokels, the very same people who caution the woman away, are shocked to hear the dangers on the mountain are worse than they ever imagined. And it's touching how they offer compassion and help to Kathy instead of gloating. But we're not done as Swain and Otis burst into town, smashing and slashing their way through the people, shedding Kathy of any hope of anyone else protecting her as she leads Otis into a machine shop, taking him on with anything she can grab until she crushes him beneath a hydraulic press. Swain goes much more quietly, silently letting himself be led away in cuffs. Kathy is the lone survivor of our initial trio. She looks up at the mountain, the horror that took away her friends, but not her. She still conquered it. As I said, the stuff in Swain's shack, where the women are imprisoned, tortured, then led to Luke one by one, is so out there, so brutal, that it really does overwhelm the script. It's very well executed, absolutely, and I was gripped as I turned every page, but I was also taken out of the story as what kept me plugging on was my desperation to see how, even gasp if, they'd get away, only to see new horrors continue to unfold. I guess that's the point, and it does succeed in both horrifying me and investing me in the outcome, but wow, what a hard investment. The rest of the script is otherwise perfect, with the steady build of the first half pulling me into the setting, the characters, the looming figures in the shadows of the trees, and when Elaine and Kathy break loose for the third act, it's an absolute roller coaster ride of thrills and tension and narrow escapes by the skin of their teeth. This is a mere excellent screenplay, and I have no doubt it would have made for a fine film in the right hands. If this was post-1978, then maybe Carpenter's then-collaborator Deborah Hill could have given it some tweaks, less than the whole breeding stock exploration of sexism, which pushed the entire story off the path they'd been treading quite well up to that point. Because other than that, this script is great, a real lost treasure in the works of Carpenter. The characters are simply but cleverly painted and don't fall into easy tropes. There's a neat red herring in the form of a map surveyor, who we think will show up in the second half to save the women, but when he arrives in the form of a corpse, it further cements that they're on their own. The pacing is wonderful as none of the Swain stuff comes into play until the literal midpoint of the script, and by then it's a constantly ratcheting crank of tension that doesn't let up until the very end. Then gives it a few more sharp cranks before ending again. Starting in the early 80s, Bob Clark became known for comedies like A Christmas Story and Porky's, and sadly ended his career directing not one, but two installments of the Baby Geniuses franchise. But in the 70s, he was a thriller man, beating slashers to the punch with the crisp, if uneven, Black Christmas, then making what is, to this day, my favorite Sherlock Holmes film, as the great detective and Watson track down Jack the Ripper in Murder by Decree. 
He was a talented filmmaker capable of atmosphere and suspense, and not at the expense of characters and story, so it would have been very interesting to see what he would do with this material. Alas, it wasn't to be. By 1978, The Hills Had Eyes had come out and brought with it a whole wave of outcast families in the desolate fringes of society who prey on any innocents who wander into their community. This is a very different work than The Hills Have Eyes, but the tropes established in the wake of Wes Craven's film pretty much beat it to the punch. Even a lot of the Otis material would seem redundant within a few more years as the giant Jason Voorhees started slashing his way through nubile victims. Prey is a project which pop culture offered a very narrow window to get off the ground, and when it didn't come to be within that window, it was too late. It would be just as hard to dust it off today as The Descent, wherein a group of women gather together for a spelunking trip, echoes much of the setup. Regarding elements later reworked into Halloween, the dynamic of Kathy, Rose, and Elaine is so similar to Laura, Annie, and Linda that these could almost be the women those teenage girls grew into, pending their brutal deaths, of course and the shadowy figures of Swain and Otis, often silent and still, watching from a distance and taking their time, feel like an early draft of what will become Michael Myers. Heck, in the first half of the script, they're often just referred to as The Shape, a term initially used to describe Michael and his killer guys. Overall, Prey is a wonderful surprise. A tantalizing glimpse at a near-Carpenter masterpiece which could have been. Yes, its attempts at exploring feminism and sexism do stumble quite severely in a few points but not in a way which couldn't be smoothed over with a few more drafts. As a character-driven thriller built around a great exterior set piece, with some genuine themes that it wants to explore, it's magnificent, and those last 20 pages are so gripping and pounding that I'll long be mourning the fact that I never got to see them on screen. Thus concludes the first audio installment of John Ocrafa. Our main show will be back next with a look at Halloween 2, and then we start into The Thing, with a couple of John Ocrafa installments covering Who Goes There, the original novella Thing was based on, and The Thing from Another World, the initial 1950s adaptation. Thank you for joining me, and I look forward to exploring more apocryphal works in the career of John Carpenter. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. <laughs>